This is a production of Cornell University. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, a little of the research that I've been doing the last four years and a half here. And everything will go around this idea of, of using uh, functional genomics to help uh, genomic prediction and genomic selection models in cassava. Okay, and back in 2013, I was about to get interviewed by Jean-Luc through Skype. And I had no idea what genomic selection was, so I started looking at the literature. And what I'm pretty sure happened with most of you trying to approach to genomic selection were haunted by this scheme that I don't even need to explain at this time. Um, this, however, at the time didn't help me to understand the, the, how these, these models were working, so I came with a, a scheme out of my own. Briefly, you have phenotypes and genotypes of a training population. And combining these two elements, you will build a prediction model that here I'm depicting it as a wormhole because I didn't have any idea of what was happening here. So what I did know was that the DNA of an unphenotyped cassava was traveling through space and time to give us genomic expected breeding values. That is basically your expectation or your prediction on how that unphenotyped cassava is going to perform in the future. Um, okay, so what I did understand at the, at the moment was that my mission within the project was to use functional genomics as a proxy to understand the biology behind the phenotypes that we're trying to, to predict and see where and, you know, try to test whether the, the inclusion of this extra element in the prediction model will be a positive one. Okay. So today I have three topics for you. Uh, we'll go through all of them, but just an important thing is that all of them will go around this idea of using biology and, and, and genomic prediction models. So again, back on, on 2013, I, 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 you know, I was new on cassava and I went to the databases trying to find genomic information and cassava was a really orphan crop. There weren't a lot of genomic resources or genomic uh, research done at the time. I was really interested in working with biotic stresses so I went to the database checking for resistant genes in cassava and I couldn't find it. So with Martha at the time, we saw it as an opportunity to both get this data, uh, this data mined and contribute a little bit to the growing genomic libraries of cassava. So we identify this family of genes, the NBSLR family, that is known to be the biggest resistant gene family in plants. We did some phylogenetics, and most importantly, we mapped them into their position of the 18 chromosomes of cassava. And this data later helped other scientists to make sense out of their GWAS results. For example, this is a publication by Ismail Kayondo, a collaborator in Uganda. He found a couple of, of QTLs for cassava brown streak disease, that's a disease in cassava. Uh, one of them being in chromosome 11, and you will have to believe me here, but if you zoom in here on the, on the peak, it collocates nicely with a small cluster of NBSLR genes. And some collaborators from uh, Kenya now are evaluating using knockouts uh, with CRISPR and complementation assays to, you know, validate these candidate genes as the resistance. So yeah, that's pretty nice. And again, that was published in 2015, but the, the years passed and cassava stopped being an orphan crop. Suddenly, in the, in the span of two or three years, there were lots of uh, research going on. We have a nice haplotype map, thanks to Ramu and the Bacter Lab, uh, plenty of transcriptomics studies, uh, a better genome with a really nice RNA-seq guided annotation. We have even methylation data and a plethora of, of tools. Um, so from now on, we switch a little bit from doing the, the, geno the genomic resources generator to be more like data scavengers and try to use all these to, to put them in the, in the genomic prediction uh, framework. Okay, 
let's make a stop here and I'm going to talk a little bit about which models we'll be using in the rest of my talk. Spoiler alert, we won't be using any fancy Bayesian or machine learning algorithms. We, we, what we will be using is just uh, different modifications of the good old GitLab uh, model. Okay, for those that don't know what GitLab model is, it's basically a mixed model fit on the basis of individuals rather than markers, but using a covariance uh, matrix that is calculated as the genomic relationship matrix. Okay. And this incorporates these genetic random effects where you basically uh, calculate the, the GRM using all the markers available. In 2014, however, this group from Alcus Price and Busef and company were interested in studying how splitting or partitioning the genomic regions into functional elements, let's say coding regions, UTR regions, promoter regions would influence uh, this model. And as you know, GBLAB models and any model that will, uh, well, most of the models that will work with within genome of predictions where we have lots of predictors and a few individuals have to find a way how to deal with collinearity and overfitting. So GBLAB use shrinkage where all, most of the uh, SNP effects well, are random and are shrunked towards zero. And this shrinkage severity will be a function of the numbers of SNPs in the model. The idea of these guys was, what if we partition the genome in different random effects, genetic random effects, and I, from now on, I'm just gonna call these guys as kernels. And if one of these kernels is enriched for causal variance due to biological priors I have, uh, this might result in an increase in prediction accuracy. Why? Because if you are relaxing the shrinkage severity, you are allowing more markers into that partition having a bigger SNP effect. Okay? So this is basically the rationale that I'm going to use on the models that I explained throughout my presentation. The second nice thing, uh, well, useful thing about this research was that uh, Gusev and collaborators uh, determined that we need to have level sequence imputation when you are using genomic partitioning uh, methodologies. Uh, basically, the, the estimation of a, a percentage of any heritabilities will be really bad if you just use genotype SNPs, for example, GES, uh, in comparison when you use genotype uh, full genome imputation marks. Okay, so yeah, this is a little of the background that will, will be going on. So just keep, keep this in mind. Now, the second topic that I wanna talk you about is the, the, the actually a case study, how my first approach to use biology to improve genomic prediction. As I told you, I was really interested in working with biotic uh, diseases, uh, biotic stresses. So Casada Brown streak disease um, was really attractive to me. So in this study, I tried to use whole genome imputation and a transcriptomic study that I will later show you uh, to increase the, the performance of this model. Just briefly, cassava brown streak disease caused by cassava brown streak virus and the unknown cassava brown streak virus, it's a really awful disease, okay? Symptoms in leaves, you have chlorosis around the secondary veins, but the most important thing is that you have root rot on the cassava tubers that make them inedible even for animal feed. Uh, and they are transmitted uh, by white flies in a semi-persistent way. Okay, so that's, that's our model now. So let's go back to my previous scheme and I'll show you how I'm gonna incorporate the, the different elements into this case. So for example, the phenotypes evaluated now will be CBSD uh, related traits, measure on leaves and roots, three months, six months, and one year after planting. The genotypes will be GBS markers that will be imputed to whole genome sequence. The wormhole or um, prediction model will be a multi-kernel GBLAB. And the, the genomics data will be transcriptomics studies, util information, and immunity-related traits. Okay, so now let's 
explain a little bit of each of these components in this study. The phenotypes we use uh, were basically on leaves and roots, a categorical scale that goes from one to five. Uh, our high throughput phenotyping scheme, Alfred is here. Uh, that about the, the phenotypes, okay? The genotypes we recognize with this Gusev uh, paper the necessity of, 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 of going from 40,000 markers that we were obtaining a, with GBS to millions of markers through whole genome imputation. And how was this possible? It's not that, that we are inventing markers that weren't typed. We use this scheme of whole genome imputation that uses the hub map that was produced by the Buckler lab. 241 individuals, including cultivated cassava, wild hybrids, uh, and wild uh, cassava relatives. And those were deep sequenced to 30x. So we have a nice haplotype maps of those 240 individuals. And what we are performing here is that when we have GBAs, we have a bunch of markers. But we also have a lot of interrogation, lots of sites that we are missing. And what the whole genome imputation algorithm does is try to infer which of these regions be, uh, belongs to which of these haplotypes and get, most importantly, the, the boundaries. Once it has the most probable haplotype of each region, it will just impute the missing genotypes with the ones present in the haplotype. And that's how you go from GBS, 42,000 markers, to millions of markers using this hub map uh, information. And now you will tell me, yeah, Roberto, you don't need millions of markers to perform uh, genomic selection. We all know that. The problem was that in, in my approach, I was interested in tagging different regions in the genome that might be important. And then if I use only the 42K markers, from GBS, I could only tag around 30% of the genome. Uh, then if I did Beagle imputation, Beagle is just an algorithm of whole genome imputation, I get to 70%. And finally, I stop uh, with Impute2, that is for me at least a better whole genome imputator, and I could get markers that will be tagging close to 92% of the genome. So that's the only reason why I keep this, this um, this uh, methodology together with those information from the Gusev paper. So, yeah, now we have phenotypes, we have genotypes, we need a population. So, this is our population. Um, this is a graph of the 18 chromosomes, and I'm plotting the LD score, the mean LD score. You don't know what the mean LD score is, just you graph each marker and then calculate the R square of that marker with all the markers in a bin of one megabase. And then you divide that by the number of markers in that bin. And you plot all of them. And it gives you a sense of local LD patterns. And as you can see here, uh, cassava has like a funky uh, pattern of high LD close to the telomeres. Um, well, there is that. Uh, second here, I'm plotting, this is a classical LD decay plot. The only thing that I'm doing differently here is that I'm coloring chromosome one and chromosome four in a yellow and red, respectively, because they have a recent introgression that doesn't have a lot of recombination. So that's what, it, what it's dragging this, this funky LD pattern. High uh, R squares even when the, the markers are positioned really far away in the chromosome. Okay, so we have markers, we have phenotypes, we have a population, and this is our bio biological data, okay? This uh, transcriptomics study was performed by Teddy Amuse and published in 2017, and she basically grabbed two contrasting genotypes, Namikonga, resistance to CBSD, and Albert's really susceptible. And she grafted uh, these varieties with infected scions and non-infected scions, and evaluated differentially gene expressed across seven different time points. Six hours after grafting, 24 hours after grafting, 48 hours, and so on, until 54 days after grafting. 
And what we observe here is that the resistant plant in yellow has a lot of differential expressions. It's really aware that, they, that it's being infected. While the Albert's plant is susceptible, uh, has like a really mild response at six hours and then nothing. Non different between the, the transcriptional pattern between the control and the infected ones in all these time points. It just starts reacting when it's, it's basically too late. So then we, we start thinking, how can we use this transcriptomic data to weigh the, the genomic prediction model? And we had several hypotheses. The first hypothesis was just brute force. Um, so yeah, let's just use all the differential express genes and compare the accuracy that we have to the whole genome imputation. This is the full model. I will always be comparing the accuracies with the full model at the last column. This is CVSD measured on leaves six months after planting, and this is measuring roots. And the model that we are running here is a two kernel model. One of the kernel will harbor all the SNPs that are tagging differential express genes, and the other uh, kernel will have the rest of the genes, everything else. So as any brute force uh, approach usually happens, it didn't have a good result the prediction accuracies were basically similar as the, the ones when we just use the whole genome imputation full data set. Then with Jean-Luc, we tried to be a little bit smarter about it. And we had this idea that maybe those genes that have a positive interaction between genotype and inoculation status, inoculation status being if the plant was controlled or inoculated, could have a better effect. A, a major effect on the on the on the resistant phenomena. So we fit this model where expression, the gene expression of each genes, will be explained by reps plus the three-way interaction of genotype, inoculation status, and time. And we extracted those genes, plotted here, that had a positive, uh, significant interaction between G by I. Okay. And similar to the last uh, picture, we calculated the genomic accuracy, the prediction accuracies for this model. In red, we have the uh, three kernel model that was fit with these G by I genes, partitioned into chromosome 11, chromosome 4, and the rest of the genome. Here we also incorporated the fact that we know that in chromosome 11 and 4, there were big, big QPLs. Okay? And we also fit a model with random, uh, random genes in the same uh, proportion. And what we saw is that our model is doing better than random for severity in leaves and roots, but we are not, still not doing better than when just using the basic GBLAB model. So yeah, that was second hypothesis. It didn't quite well work yet. So then we have a third hypothesis. What if instead of using the differentially expressed genes, we just use a clustering method, whole genome, uh, no, weighted gene co-expression network analysis to, to try to mine important genes. And let's focus in, in this part of the, of the slide. The colors are a little off, but it's fine. To, to have a better idea of what weighted gene co-expression network analysis is doing, it's just, it's just clustering genes that have a similar expression pattern. And if you go to the, to the black module here, and you'll have to believe me because the colors are off, this black um, module has genes that are expressed only in the Namikonga genotype. And then we have another cyan module that are mostly expressed in Albert, okay? Uh, this should be way redder, more red. The colors are a little off. But anyway, we get a bunch of modules with this technique. And again, we try our technique of two kernels. Let's get the genes that are within our module and everything else in the genome and compare them with the last column that will be the whole genome imputation. This model. Not very good results. The only one that was uh, doing better than the whole uh, model was this module reds and only for three months. 
So no really good results at the, at the time. So we come up with a fourth hypothesis that was basically desperation. And we mix different sources of information, trying to beat uh, the performance with holding of imputation. And we did it, but with, you know, from ranging from 1.7 to 2.5% uh, overall prediction accuracy. So it wasn't a big game, but it was a little game. And we have several uh, options why this approach didn't work as, as we were expecting. There is the thing of the trade uh, genetic architecture. These CBSD resistant in these populations have big QTLs. And maybe trying to mine information out, out of the RNA seq data is not really viable because of those two big QTLs. Uh, our imputation accuracy was performed on a hub map that only has 640 individuals. There is issues with the phenotyping platform. Uh, the transcriptomics experiment. It was only performed on two varieties that might not be representative of the population that we are working in. And finally, the, the, the transcriptomic experiment was, used, uh, was infected using only one strain of the virus, not with the two. And what usually happens in field in reality is that there is a co-infection of Ugandan cassava brown streak virus and cassava brown streak virus. Okay. 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 <clears throat> Water pause, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, what, one of the things that was also disturbing me until that point was that we were only looking for important genes or important regions within the gene. And the gene, genic region is only a tiny part of the whole genome, also the whole cassava genome. There are functional elements happening outside of the genes. And yeah, the motivation for doing this third part of my, of my thesis work uh, was this article that I, I read on 2014 by Manolo Skelis from the ENCODE project. And there was a lot of troubles because the guys from the ENCODE say 80% of the human genome is transcribed, so 80% of the human genome is functional. No, and then there were lots of the evolutionary biologists saying, you cannot say that because you are not under the light of evolution. Uh, that can be true. I mean, the, the, the guys from ENCODE found evidence for 80% of the, gen the human genome uh, that was transcribed, but we also have to consider other evidence. We have genetic evidence that is basically that that generates phenotype and will be what you find when you run a GWAS. And you have also evolutionary evidence, meaning that regions in the genome that are constrained by evolution are more probable, probable functional. So yeah, in, in the light of this, I was also interested in trying to find functional elements outside of the cassava genome. So that brings us to this, uh, expanding the CASAVA functional genome using ProSeq. And back in 2015, John Lees uh, from Cornell Biotech published this article that kind of excited me a little bit. Uh, she was doing this nascent RNA sequencing. And the important thing you need to know about these nascent uh, techniques is that allows you to sequence the RNAs that are inside the nucleus. So you can sequence the mRNAs before being spliced, but you can also sequence all those unstable RNAs that are later degraded in the, in the cytoplasm, okay? And by doing that, uh, John and collaborators found that um, in promoters, for example, Imagine that this is your promoter, your gene is in this part. Of course, you will have a transcript going on the, on the side of the gene. But what he found was that the, there was an unstable RNA also being transcribed on the opposite direction. More importantly, he discovered that in enhanced regions outside of the, of the genes, there was a similar pattern. Surrounding the, the, the enhancer will be transcription of, of a small RNA in both directions, and those RNAs were called enhancer RNAs. The next year, 
uh, Charles Danko, in collaboration also with Adam Sipel and John Lees, published this uh, DREG method. It was a machine learning, a support vector regression uh, machine that will allow you to, based on that uh, nascent RNA sequencing, identify transcription regulatory elements, including promoters and enhancers. And that's what I believe, hey, maybe we can apply this idea to cassava and identify enhancers that might be important to explain phenotypes outside of, of the genes. Uh, so I was super excited. We talked with John. We were starting to do the, the planning and everything. And in 2016, uh, they published this article in using nascent RNA in Arabidopsis. And it was the first study that was performed on plants. And it was really disappointed at the time because they say, you know, in plants, there is lack of enhanced RNAs, lack of bidirectional transcription, lack of promoter proximal posing. Uh, plants are completely different than mammals and other metazoans. So I was really sad because we were in the middle of an experiment trying to identify these enhancers using the enhancer RNAs that, according to these people, were completely absent in plants. But, you know, we were in the middle of the experiment, so we just kept going. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'll explain a little bit of these metagene plots. So, this, this is what will happen in the human around the transcription start site. So, this is where the polymerase first attaches and then start transcribing in, di in this direction. So, you will have uh, the transcription of the RNA, and this peak at the beginning is called the pausing phenomenon. Okay, so where basically the polymerases are attached to the beginning of the gene and they are just waiting for an additional stimuli to start transcription. So, and also there is this bidirectional transcription on the stable RNA in the opposite direction. In Arabidopsis, however, they observe two things. There is no posing, there's just transcription, and there is no bidirectional uh, transcription. Okay. So we were in the middle of the experiment. Uh, and I feel that sometimes when you try to understand a new molecular technique, the better thing to understand it is go through the protocol. So I will just walk you guys through the protocol a little bit. So GROW-seq or PRO-seq are a goal for global or precision random sequencing. And what this me uh, method do uh, does is it will sequence RNAs that are attached to the polymerase inside the nucleus. So you start with a plant cell here. Then you have to extract the nuclei. So you will only have the nucleus. And you go up here. Once you have the nucleus, you disrupt the nuclear membrane, remove the nucleotides, the, the original nucleotides, and put lots of biotinylated entities into the solution. And then let the, the conditions of the cell culture uh, so that the polymerase can, will be able to incorporate these nucleotides at least to position, okay? Then, since those uh, NTPs are biotinylated, you will just use spectrovidin to extract those, and then you just create, follow the steps to create a regular NGS library. You will end up with strand-specific uh, nascent RNA-seq library. So, first uh, result we wanted to check is, is if was that if the things observed in Arabidopsis were the same that we were observing in cassava. And the first thing that we observed is that the cassava nascent RNA profile around the trans transcription star site is a hybrid between Arabidopsis and human. You see, there is posing, evidenced by this peak, but there is lack of bidirectional transcription. If we go to the termination site, or sorry, the polyadenylation site at the end of the gene, then we see that the cassava profile looks quite similar to the Arabidopsis profile. And well, the humans don't have this peak at the end of the gene. So if we, you see the start of the gene looks like this. If you look for the end of the gene, it looks like this. Uh, one, one of the things that, that the Arabidopsis people say that was that there are no posing in plants. 
and then in cassava we found osin in plants. Then they say there is no bidirectional transcription, and I kind of saw this little bump here and say, okay, let's try to find some genes that might have this bidirectional transcription. And of course, I found some examples that have it. This is an IGB image of the RNA, uh, nascent RNA seq reads. The gene is going in that direction. You have the posing peak and the transcription, uh, but you also have this bidirectional transcription in the opposite direction. So there was bidirectional transcription, at least in cassava, in a way less uh, amount that was observed in humans, but there was some. So I ask myself, like, what if, if cassava can have bidirectional transcription, at least in some genes, maybe they still have enhanced RNA. So I annotate peaks in intergenic regions, first using uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation peak color in Homer, and I found this pattern of bidirectional transcription across these elements that were outside genes. So I say, okay, maybe if I found those elements, I can still run the, the support vector regression model that was trained in mammals to identify transcription regulatory elements outside the genes. I run it, I found the same pattern, and now I found 9,665 elements that were transcribed outside the gene having these specific patterns. So they kind of look like enhancers at the moment. So I try to further characterize them and we had some methylation that are available. So I wanted to plot the methylation on, in the three different contexts around these regions, okay? This is a, um, let me explain you a little bit. These graphs goes from 0% to 100% of an element, and then 3KB upstream and 3KB downstream, okay? This is a random set of regions across the genome. So this is how methylation looks in cassava, in the CHH context, in the CPG context, and in the CHG context. This is the pattern that you observe across genes, really low methylation in the promoter and, and in the termination and CPG methylation. And interestingly, the, the elements that we found outside genes had this methylation uh, pattern similar to what is observed in genes, but a little inflated or methylated. Uh, then I was interested also in check how conserved these elements were. In my mind, enhancer had to be conserved, and I was kind of wrong. So in yellow, you see these are GERB scores. So basically, the higher the GERB score, the most conserved those regions are across um, uh, closely related uh, species including Jatropha, Flax, and, and other things. So basically, you see, again, from 0% to 100% of the feature we're analyzing, yellow is genes, super conserved. Blue is random sequences. And in orange, it was our enhancer candidate genes. And we observe here that they are actually, yeah, non-conserved. So I was a little worried. Then I, I, I read this, this research that was done 2016, I believe, where they studied enhancer evolution across 20 mammalian species, and they found that mammalian uh, enhan uh, enhancers are rapidly evolving uh, sequences. Quoting them, enhancers are rare, rarely conserved across these mammals, unbiased mapping leaks candidate enhancers with lineage-specific positive selection. This a little bit of evidence on top of evidence that this thing that we found might actually be enhancers. And the last test that we, we want to try is, okay, if the, 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 the enhancers might be important to explain a phenotype, they should be explaining more phenotypic variants in, 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 any, in populations for, for example, yield components. So we, we made a test. We have a portion of my genome, imagine that the whole circle is the cassava genome. We have a small portion, 1% of the genome is represented by these enhancer candidate genes. And what I did is select all the markers inside here. I LD protected them. So any marker that, that would have an R square higher than 
in a 150k region across them, I will just toss them out. And then I will uh, build the, another kernel with the rest of the genome. And I will compare what I have here with my null hypothesis of a random set of markers that have the same distribution of the enhancer that I found, also protected by a 4LD and the second kernel. And when we found, when, the, when we ran the genomic partitioning and the percentage of phenotypic variance that is explained for several traits on the enhancer regions on blue to random regions in orange, is that for most of the traits, dry matter content, fresh yield, root uh, number, root weight, and shoot weight, they are explaining way more phenotypic variance than the random traits. The only trait that this is not working is for CMD. And it kind of makes sense. The blue dot is hidden behind it. But it makes sense because CMD is regulated by most probably a single locus with a massive QTL in chromosome 12. Yeah. So yeah, the is, is we've made a case where we found these, these elements outside genes that are transcribed, are not evolutionary conserved, have a specific methylation pattern, and explain more phenotypic variants than in its random uh, counterpart. So we, we kind of think that these might be enhancers, and this would be a really nice method to identify them in plants. And I think that's it. Um, thank you very much. This was a really a, a big, 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 big team effort. Uh, when I went to Uganda, actually, I, I really understood the, the effort that is put into getting one of your data cells. In R. So, yeah, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.